Welcome everyone to this evening's event, a partnership between Writers at York and the York Festival of Ideas. I'm Sophie Colombo, lecturer in English Literature and Creative Writing at the University of York. And now it is my very, very great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Leila Slimani. Leila Slimani is the author of many works of fiction and non-fiction, including Chanson Douce, published in the UK as Lullaby, for which she won France's most prestigious literary prize, the Prix Goncourt. She was the first Moroccan woman in the prize's history to do so. A journalist and a frequent commentator on women's and human rights, she is French President Emmanuel Macron's personal representative for the promotion of the French language and culture. We are delighted to welcome Leila to chat with me today about her latest novel, published in French as Le Pays des Autres by Gallimard and in the UK as The Country of Others by Faber. And this is the first instalment in a trilogy of which two parts are forthcoming. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Leila to the screen. Hello. Hello, thank you so much for joining us. How are you. you? And um, from whereabouts are you, are you joining us? Uh, I'm in Lisbon. I'm in my house in Lisbon. Oh, lovely. I'm not sure if it's as hot there as here. I'm in a very sweaty Norfolk. No, it was last week, but we sent all the, the warm uh, and the heat to you. But now we are OK. OK, well, thank you. We'll try to enjoy it. Um, congratulations on The Country of Others, your latest novel, which I found moving, maddening and utterly riveting. Um, set during the Moroccan struggle for independence in the wake of World War II, uh, it follows the story of Mathilde, a young French woman who has moved to Meknes um, for love. Would you tell us something about how you came to write the story? Yes, um, actually this story is very much inspired by the story of my family and more precisely by the couple of my grandparents. I by the couple of my grandparents. When my friends would come and visit them, they would always tell me, wow, your grandmother, the Alsatian woman living in the countryside in this big farm in Meknes, she's so fascinating. And she was, she was very tall. She was blonde with green eyes. My grandfather, he was very small. They had a very big difference and he was really dark skinned. He wouldn't speak. He was very silent. My grandmother was very she spoke Arabic, so it was very funny to hear her speak um, Arabic. So I think that everyone has always told me, wow, it would be the greatest novel. You have one day to write a novel about your grandparents. And a few years ago, I told my publisher about this story, and I told him that one day I was going to write about this. And he said, yeah, maybe, but not now. You're too young and I'm not sure it's a good idea. That's something you should write when you are like 55 or 60, like you write something about your family. So he was not convinced at all. And when I received the Goncourt Prize, I went on a book tour, international book tour for like one year and a half, almost two years. And it was really, at the end, it was really exhausting. And um, I, little bit lost track of who I was as a person, as a writer, because I was so tired and I was always speaking about me and my books and all this, and it was really weird. And so when I was alone in, in my hotel rooms and thinking about what could I write about, uh, the first thing that came to me were the souvenir of my childhood and especially the souvenir of what my grandmother told me about her, um, uh, how she met my grandfather, how they fell in love and all this. And I showed some pages to my publisher and he said, oh, okay, that's what you want to do. You want really to write fiction because he understood that my point was not at all to write something really about my grandparents or to do a sort of investigation or try to, to find a certain truth about my family. 
Uh, first of all, I'm not interested in truth at all. My people of my family were all big liars. So they were always lying about everything. So I just used the lies of the people of my family. So Mathilde is a sort of fantasized vision of my grandmother. I think she is the woman my grandmother would have loved to be. She is a very passionate girl. Um, she is also very frustrated because at the beginning of the book, she's like 18 or 19. It's the end of the war. But of course, because of the war, she lost um, all the best years of her life and uh, the teenage years of her life. And she wants to live things. She wants to meet boys. She wants to be in love. She wants to have sex. She wants all the kind of things that you want when you are 18. And most of all, she doesn't want to have the same life um, as her mother or her sister or the neighbors of the little town she's living in. She doesn't want to become just a bourgeois married with children. Uh, she wants something different and uh, she wants to be able to tell people that what she has is different. And so, um, yes, she falls in love. And I think it's really sincere with this man, I mean, but not only with this man, but with this idea of maybe going to Africa and marrying someone who is so different and who is going to give her the adventure she's, um, she's dying for. So this is a love story, but this is also the story of a very big desire of not having the same life of every woman she, she knows and uh, uh, who are next to her. Thank you. That's so interesting to hear how particular details from the narrative, um, you know, some have come from uh, from facts like the height difference, which is, you know, so such a kind of rich metaphor and used so richly throughout the text. Um, and the the idea about all your family being liars, I think it's Matilda's father who uh, who is talked about as a as a great liar. Um, and and so interesting to hear what your publisher's initial reaction was and and his kind of idea of what sorts of books you should write while you're a young woman and then maybe when you get to 55 what you can write then um i felt you know from one reader's point of view um this felt like a different sort of novel from uh, adele and from lullaby um where you're kind of moving from this relatively short chronological scope to a much longer one from this very punchy kind of um, high concept hook as people in publishing would call it to this dense multi-threaded rich narrative uh, from one or maybe two protagonists you're moving to to many um, and so it's interesting that that is that that was seen by your publisher as kind of a, a, an older person's fiction um, but he's he's sold on it now presumably and he he accepts that it's a uh, 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 the sort of book that you uh, can and should be writing. Um, you once said, I think, um, in an interview, that you write, you find yourself writing about the things that frighten you. Um, so, with uh, your first novel, Adele, um, you know, the loss of control to addiction, and then with um, Lullaby, it's the possibility, perhaps, of endangering or losing your children. Um, and I was wondering, does that still apply to the country of others within this, this multi-generational rich saga? Um, what's the particular story or stories that scare you? Um, there are many things. First, I think that the project itself scares me. The idea of spending six or maybe eight years writing about the same family <laughs> and trying to write a big, big novel, a big saga uh, with a certain coherence about the story of Morocco and of my family. Of course, it's really frightening. It's frightening because I'm not sure I'm able to do it. It's frightening because it's about my family. And uh, so I have to deal also with what can I use that is true? What should I not use because I don't want people to be hurt? And also the fact that I'm, I know that I'm going to say things that um, people maybe will not understand or people will judge me for that because it's the story of a family who is uh, a mixed race family. Uh, all the characters are really suffering of not being able to belong to any community. 
Um, and in the second part of the book that I published two or three months ago in, in France called Watch Us Dance, this is the second generation, so the generation of the children. And here the problem is more a problem of social class. They have become bourgeois and they belong to a certain elite and they are very influenced by the ideas from the West. And in a certain way, not only they can't belong because they don't have a real identity, but the fact that they are this kind of bourgeois uh, create a sort of big distance with the people of Morocco. And I am the child of those people. And um, to be really honest, I've always known that, uh, and it's a sort of paradox because as a writer, what I want to do is to say the truth. And the thing is that I know that I can't say the truth. If I say exactly what I think about Morocco, people are going to say, uh, why do you speak about Morocco? You're just a bourgeois, you're francophone, you don't belong here, uh, we don't want to listen to you. If I say exactly and very sincerely what I think about France, people are going to say, but you're an immigrant. How dare you criticize this country that is so much bigger than you? So this is exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, to, yeah, to convey and to express how difficult it can be when you are between two identities, two culture, two countries, and that you feel that you never really belong. That the people think that you have two things and you feel that you have zero. Um, so this is this, uh, this conflict that I'm trying to, that I'm trying to explain. So yes, it's frightening me, especially because today in the context of today, this is so difficult to explain this and this is so complex and we need nuance and we need ambiguity. And uh, today it's very difficult to make people hear and understand ambiguity and nuance. And fiction is perhaps one way in which that project can be aided. Um, it's it's fortuitous that you've, you've, you've come on to talk about um, uh, nationhood and politics and belonging, um, because I'm, I'm conscious that, of course, you didn't go straight from writing Lullaby to writing The Country of Others. Um, and in between was a, a marvelous essay collection, uh, which was published in English as Sex and Lies. Um, and in that collection, you retell the words of the Moroccan women who have approached you uh, in the wake of your earlier novels to share their stories, um, particularly their experiences of how they have tried to navigate a society that really has a problem with a sexual double standard. Um, and I, I couldn't help but wonder reading The Country of Others in particular, where uh, whether uh, the subplot, the story of Selma um, Matilda's sister-in-law um, might have been in some ways influenced or inflected by that project, by writing Sex and Lies. Um, it, might this be the case? No, actually, um, I don't want to reveal anything about my, my family because this project is also something I'm so very secretive and I inspired by a true story that happened in my family. And in my family, there were um, and uh, really, really complex and terrible and tragic that happened to women that I like that so it's not something that only happened to others oh it happened also not to me but to people who are very very close to me and um, a few days ago I was with one of my cousin and we were telling each other those stories and we were like so shocked because today we are in 2022 and we were thinking about things that happened 30 years ago or 40 years ago and it seems completely crazy to imagine that it could have happened but um no it was really inspired by uh, by a true story in my in my family but uh, i think that at the same time sex and lie and all my books 
comes from this sense of injustice that I had very, very early in my life. Um, I think that as a child, as a little girl, uh, I was aware maybe at six or seven years old, I was very much aware of the fact that um, a girl wouldn't have the same life as a man or the same rights or the same possibilities that being free for a woman was much more complicated. and. I was surrounded by very strong women, by women who tried to be free. Uh, but sometimes when I think about it, um, I think that they were very much alienated also. They tried to be free, but the cost of freedom is so, so high that May, the woman who inspired Selma, who was one of my aunts, she was very free, but she paid a very, very, a big prize for that. Her life was was terrible, was tragic. So this is also the story of sex and lie. I think that at the end of the book, that's what made, made me very sad. The majority of women told me, if I had to read, to do it again, I won't redo it. I would not choose freedom. I would choose to marry and to shut up, which is terrible. But they say, I, it's not worth it because yeah, I'm free, but I'm alone. And I'm a pariah, I'm so marginalized. What's the point of being free if you're just alone? I'm terribly worried for Selma now um, and what's, what, what, what will be coming, coming her way. Um, I, if I may, I'd like to get a little bit personal now and discuss what first brought me to your body of work and is still, um, I think, the thing perhaps that I admire most about it. Um, and that is its treatment of the tender, painful, resentful, ambivalent, sometimes shocking states of motherhood. Um, since having my own daughter three years ago, I've become very interested in the recent phenomenon that um, my brilliant colleague uh, Alice Hall has called in conversation something like the childcare novel or the novel of care. Um, I'm thinking here of uh, novels such as Hannah Ostavik's Love, Kylie Reed's Such a Fun Age, uh, Rachel Yoda's Night Bitch, and many more. Um, and at the very head of the pack, uh, I'm so grateful for your works, honesty, um, in narrating the way that motherhood can divide one against oneself, um, and for its bravery in contemplating the potential effects of such a division. Um, Looking at all your protagonists, uh, Adele, Miriam, Louise, Mathilde, um, they're all mothers and they all experience a sort of split between their mothering selves and their other selves, whether they be sexual or professional or social. Um, and my question is, I suppose, could you perhaps talk to us a little about how you see motherhood impacting selfhood and how you try to address this through art. Yeah, um, all my characters are very uh, ambiguous, as you said, when it comes to their feelings uh, towards motherhood. At the same time, I think that Miriam or Louise or Adele and Mathilde, they love their children. The problem is not a problem of love. They love their children, but it's difficult. It's heavy. And um, all of them, at one point, they ask themselves, what if I left? What if I left my family and be the woman I am again? And um, just being really free, not uh, being responsible of anyone and uh, not being worried for anyone. And the fact also that we are raised in this sort of myth that uh, motherhood is going to be very natural because we are so, as women, we are so tender and so sweet that it's going to be easy to spend afternoon when it's raining outside, afternoon with a child who is two or three and who is yelling and screaming and hungry and in a bad mood and to play with him and never get on your nerve and never want him to want, want to take him and get it out of the, of the window. No, no one speaks of this violence or if people speak of that, they speak of that as something abnormal, something that is, um, you know, that defines crazy women, dangerous women. 
But then when I had my first child and um, I asked some of my friends, all of them, they told me, but you know, I feel that too. Me too, sometimes I want to get out of the house and to close the door and to go out for two or three days and no one can call me and to forget about the fact that now I am a mother. My mother was a wonderful mother, but she was a super mother. She was uh, always taking care of us and uh, she was sleeping with us, doing the homework with us, were working and being a wife and she was doing so many things. And everyone was admiring my mother. And I think that as a child, I, I looked at her and I was like, wow, it looks so difficult. And um, she was like also, yeah, I think she loved her. She loved us very much and all that, but she didn't nothing else but taking care of us. She was never thinking of herself and she completely, yeah, forget about, her, about herself. So myself, I made a promise to myself not to do that. And um, I'm probably not a good mother, uh, not a perfect mother, of course, maybe not even a good mother. I'm probably very selfish. But who knows how we are supposed to do it. I do it as I can. And that's what I'm trying also to convey in my book. Women who are trying to do their best. There are some days when you wake up and you're like, okay, today I'm going to do my best and try to give them what they need and be patient and all that. And you have days where you are very bad and uh, you get very impatient. And at the end of the day, you go to sleep and you're like, oh my God, this day, what did I do? I was not a good mother. That's just reality. And that's what I'm trying to, to convey. Today, I was very proud of myself because I was very patient with my children and I watched a, a Truffaut movie with my son who liked it very much. So yeah, it's very fulfilling because at the end of the day, I'm happy that I tried to do things with them and not, yeah, not yell and not be impatient. This is so heartening to hear, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> um, having my daughter has also brought me to realize how motherhood can transform not only the writing one does, but also the ways in which one does it. And the terms in which you have thanked your husband in your most recent acknowledgements, I think you, you call him the guardian of your office door or something like that. Uh, that wording made me suspect that you have found this too. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little about what your writing process is like and how you make sure that you give your work the intent, the attention it deserves. Oh, it's more and more difficult actually, because the problem that I have is a problem of time. I don't have enough time. Um, so I publish a lot. I published a lot those past years. I published the most one book per year. So I have a lot of promotion to do because when I promote the book in France and then I have to promote it in different countries. So it's a lot of interviews, a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, and all this are the enemies of writers. Uh, I need silence, I need solitude, I need boredom. I need to be just focused on my book to be able to, to write, to really write. So now I'm fighting for time and I'm fighting for time alone. Um, I'm very lucky because my husband understood, understood that a long time ago. And uh, I can really, when I'm at home, tell him, okay, you have to make sure that no one is coming in my office, that the children are not going to bother me. And maybe I won't come for dinner. Don't ask me. I, I will come if I want. And it's something really important to have people around you who really support you and understand that um, you have to be completely, completely focused and committed on your work. But um, yeah, it's, it's difficult because the more you get old and the more responsibility you have and the more solicitation you have. So I'm struggling to find the time. We are, we are so grateful for this one hour from your schedule. Um, I do understand the impact it must have. Um, we're moving, speaking of time, we're moving towards the later questions um, that I'm going to ask before turning to 
our chat um, function to see if the audience have any questions they'd like to put to you. So um, I would like at this point to encourage any members of the audience who have questions for Leila to just, um, sorry, put them not in the chat, that's exactly what I was not supposed to say, to put them in the Q&A box. Um, but if we if we do end up with them only in the chat, I'm sure we can, we can look at those as well. Um, this is this is really my second last question. Um, one of my other favorite writers, the pre-romantic novelist Frances Burney, um, also a woman of two cultures, she wrote under the name Madame D'Arblay as well and passed much of her life in France. Um, she was of the opinion that authors to write first must read. Um, and I often remind myself of that when I'm in a rut and think about who I need to read and, and how in order to refresh my kind of writing brain. And I was wondering, who do you read? Who has influenced your work? Um, as many people as you would like to talk about. Oh, those past years, I have to say that I read a lot of American novels. Uh, American novels from, um, especially from the South, Afro-American novels. I feel very close to this literature. Um, the questions about uh, race, about sex, uh, about segregation, the relationship with nature that can be at the same time very hostile or very welcoming, very beautiful. So um, I would say that my big influences those past year would be Toni Morrison, would be Baldwin, William Styron, Flannery O'Connor, Carson McCullers. There are the writers that I read a lot. Um, and I just discovered a, a writer that I love very much called Ayad Akhtar. He's a, an American novelist from um, Pakistan. And he, he wrote really good books about being Muslim in, in America. So yeah, I have to say that uh, those past years, I was very much influenced by American novels, but like 10 years ago, it was Russian novels that I was reading all the time, but it depends on what I'm working on. And I think that this project, The Country of Others, I don't know why, but feels very close to all the topics that are um, in the those kinds of Southern uh, novels. In Flannery O'Connor or Faulkner, you have those kinds of things about um, yeah, sensuality and all this. So that's probably why I'm reading this right now. That's fascinating, thank you. I think, I think that will lead me to reread The Country of Others with uh, fresh eyes. Um, now, happily for your readers, um, The Country of Others is the first in a trilogy. And this is a, a, a question that I think speaks very much to the theme of our York Festival of Ideas, a new chapter. Um, so, you know, one part down, two to go. I think you mentioned, did you mention just now that the second installment is called Watch Us Dance? And yes, that, that, that has been published in French yeah. already? Okay, wonderful. So that, that's music to my ears. Um, can, what, can, what can you tell us um, about where Matilda, Aisha, Selma, and all the others are going next. Um, and when can we expect that those of us who unfortunately are not Francophone enough to, to read the French version adequately, when can we expect to be able to, um, to buy the novel in, in English? So it, it will be published next summer, so summer 23 in, um, in the UK and uh, in the US also. And uh, this, uh, the book begins in 1968. And it's the beginning of the hippie movement in, in Morocco. The, so a lot of hippies arrived in Morocco during the summer of 68, and they stayed for like two years. And this is the moment of counterculture in, in Morocco. Uh, people, uh, students are uh, doing riots in the streets. Uh, people are listening to rock and roll. Uh, American lit uh, culture also is very much influencing uh, Morocco. So this is a lot about um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Wow, excellent. And that's the, um, that's the sort of second generation, which is Absolutely. In, in, in your parents' generation, if you, uh, yeah. want to look at it like that. Um, okay, this is this is absolutely wonderful. Um, 
we've got some questions in the q a coming through from the audience so we're a little ahead of time but i'm going to turn to those because i would i would love to have those um have those included um one attendee who is anonymous has said hello Layla. it's so interesting that you describe your family as being big liars something that is probably true of so many of our families but which we never admit to once you realized that was the case did you feel that it gave you the freedom and inspiration to start writing your own fiction and therefore speak a deeper truth absolutely yeah absolutely and um there were all liars my parents my grandparents but they didn't lie about the fact that they were lying they would say that they were lying and my parents would always tell me you know if you have a story to tell and the story is not really interesting lie add something <laughs> uh, add a situation add a character uh, add a, or the anecdote is not interesting in my family it was very much about telling a good anecdote telling a good story and if you want to tell a good story you have to be able to lie a little bit um it was never bad lies or um, perverse lies that could hurt someone but we would lie to make life bigger to make life funnier to make life i don't know with more panache and um you know, it was a lot. I was thinking a lot about that also. My parents were very secretive. I think they lied also because they didn't want to tell the truth because sometimes the truth is so sad and so painful. And um, I think that I have to thank them very much, uh, not only for lying, but uh, for keeping secrets and for not telling me everything. We live in a society where we think that we should all say everything, that we should all show everything that we should take picture of our breakfast and our house and our children and all this. Uh, I hate that. I lie all the time. I have a lot of secrets. I think that what I don't say makes me stronger. And um, my mother would always say, what you don't say belongs to you. What you say belongs to your enemies. And it's something that it's really true. And it's for me, I think it's very important to keep some things for yourself. You know, when you're a child, the first time when you keep something to yourself, you become an individual. The first secret makes you an individual. At the beginning, when you're a little child, you say everything. You don't keep secrets. You become a free person the day you have your first secret because you have an inner life you you become someone so yeah thank really to, i want to thank them for their secret and for their lives because thank to them i can be a, a writer i can invent whatever I, I want i i don't have the burden of the truth what a what a great answer thank you and that segues really neatly into um our next quest question which is from one of my colleagues the wonderful poet Vani capildeo um who says Hello, and thank you so much for gracing us with your time and energy in this interview. If you find that one day you are the mother of an emerging writer, how would you parent your writer child? Wow. Oh. Uh, I would love to have a child who is a writer, but at the same time, I would be very worried. Um, but it would make sense. I mean, it would be logical. My children are living in books all the time and uh, I'm always sharing with them my anxiety and all this. Um, I think that my son could be a writer. He's a wonderful drawer. He draws very well and he writes also very well. He reads a lot, so why not? But, uh, you know, it's at the beginning, um, it was a dream for me to become a writer. And um, the beginning was the ten years and um, I'm afraid because I'm like, I have 30 years more. It's going to be difficult to be alone all the time, to try to imagine another world, other people and try to take things out of your of your soul of your head of your belly it's difficult so 
I don't know. I think my children and whatever they want to do, if they want to be a clown or whatever, I would always support them. I just want them to be the best in what they do. And so say all of us. Um, Tahira, the, uh, the next um, guest asking, asking a question in the Q&A, um, is wondering how much research you do for historical novels. Um, and I, I, I confess I was wondering myself um, about, I, I read that your um, maternal grandmother, uh, in some ways the model for Matilda, uh, published her own autobiographical novel. So I, I'm glad this question came up because I was interested in, in how you stood in relation to that work of fiction published by your own grandmother. But, you know, to hear his question first, how much research do you do? A lot, a lot, of course, a lot. Um, but, you know, I was a, a journalist for many years and I was uh, specialized uh, on Maghreb and especially on, on Morocco. So as a journalist and a political journalist, I knew a lot of things about the history of, of my country. But of course, I had to do a lot of research. I read a lot of books and then uh, I spent a lot of time searching for archives, for photographs, uh, interviewing historians and uh, also witness of this period of time. And of course, I used also what my grandmother not only wrote, but told me because my grandmother wrote this book in German and she tried to publish this book in Germany because she was uh, born in Germany and she was raised in German. So it, it was her first language. And uh, she tried to publish the book in Germany, but when she arrived there, because the book is very much uh, focused on the story of her family, of her parents and grandparents, and of Alsace and Germany, and uh, the publisher in Germany said, no, you know, we're not interested in this book. We published so many books about the war and about Alsace, so it's not. So she decided to translate the book, but she didn't write very well in French. For her, French was a little bit difficult. So I was maybe 13 or 14 years old. She asked my, me for help. And so I helped my, my grandmother. I was typing on the computer. She was telling me and I was typing on the computer and helping her and correcting because she couldn't use the right times in, in French. So it was very funny and I loved this yeah, this moment that I shared with her. So of course, all those stories, I know them by heart because I wrote them myself with her. So you actually had a hand in bringing that novel to publication. Yeah, That's absolutely. wonderful. Um, our next question is actually about translation. And um, Luke has an excellent question for you. He asks, have you read your work since it has been published in English? And does it change the feel of the story for you in any way? Yes, of course, of course, I, I read it. Um, I have uh, an excellent translator, Sam Taylor, that I like very much and uh, that I admire very much. And I'm very lucky because I had the same translator sim since uh, my first novel. And it makes a real difference because I think that Sam now really knows me. He knows how I think, he knows how I write, he knows my obsession, he knows my vocabulary, my universe. So um, I have to say that the more I read the translation and the closest it is to my work and to the, um, the original work uh, in, in French, I really feel that there is no difference. Now, when I read the book in English, I think that after like, three or four pages, I even forget that it is in English. If I feel, it feels like I wrote it. So no, I'm really, really happy of uh, what Sam did with the, the translation. That's wonderful. And pr presumably Sam is currently at work on Watch Us Dance. It just finished it. He sent it to me yesterday. Oh, wonderful. Um, Luke has also asked, um, would you like to see your work made into a series or film at all? Is that an idea you find exciting or not? It's already on, on track. Um, we are already writing the, the, the TV show. Yeah, it's going to be a TV show. Is that for the country of others? Yeah. Ah. yeah three seasons, one season per, per, per book. So yeah, it's going to be one. That's amazing. Very, very pleased to hear that. We'll have to keep a lookout. Um, next up, an anonymous attendee asks, 
thank you, Leila. I would like to ask about how it feels to go from being a writer inspired by other works to a published author who inspires others. Does it change how you feel about writing now that you know you are influencing other writers too? You know, it's very weird and maybe you won't believe me, but uh, not only I never think of that, but I'm not really conscious of the fact that people read my books. Uh, you know, even today, and I went to a lot of festival conferences, presentation and all that. When people come to me and say, oh, I read your book and I loved it, I'm always surprised. I'm always like, wow, that's so weird that people are reading my books. You know, I, I live in in a sort of other dimension. I mean, here is really, I have a certain distance with real life. Uh, so maybe I influence, but I have no idea of, of that. And uh, um, I admire uh, writers so much and uh, I'm very much influenced by very talented and extraordinary writers. And I could never think that uh, in my position, I could have, the same kind of, of influence on any, any, anyone. For me, it's impossible. I think many of us here would disagree. Um, I don't want to center myself in the conversation, but um, when I first started to write and talk with my, my literary agent about a novel about motherhood and monstrosity, the first thing he said to me was, have you read Leila Slimani? You must do. That was how I came to your work. So yes, you 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 are you are influencing. Um, Emily Moran, who is uh, another brilliant colleague of mine um, at the in the Department of English and Related Cultures at the University of York, has um, a question. She says, "Bonsoir, Leila. Thank you so much for making the time to speak to us. I was wondering whether you could tell us about the ways in which you have been experimenting." with site-specific writing, either in your recent book, Le Parfum des Fleurs La Nuit, or for your work um, for Sex et Mensonge. What kind of impact have particular places had on your writing and the ways in which you think about it? That's an excellent question, really an excellent question, because I think that in my books, places are characters as much as the characters, the human characters. Um, people made me realize or told me that the style uh, of uh, the country of other is very different from lullaby. And I said, of course, it is very different, much more sensual, much more colorful, more. And I said, it's because it's Morocco. You can't write about Paris today as you write about Morocco 50 years ago. Morocco is a place um, so full of sensuality, of colors, of spices, of smells. The, the relationship you have with, with food, with nature is very different from living in the center of Paris in the 29, 21th century. So um, of course, I think that my style, even my language is very, very much influenced by the, the place the novel is uh, situated in. And um, Le Parfum des Fleurs la Nuit is a very good example. The fact that I was in Venice uh, influenced my work very much. The fact that I was on the water, that I was in this country that is, uh, at the same time, a, country, a city from the West and a city also from the Orient and from Byzance made me realize something. So yeah, I think that I have some a very strong uh, relationship with places that uh, really influence me. And I think that being in, in Lisbon now is going probably to influence my writing too. Thank you. Um... An anonymous attendee has asked, I'm really glad this came up. Um, can you tell us about your experiences as a representative for the promotion of the French language and culture? Um, and I'm personally, I'm so glad that came up because um, I found myself wondering uh, whether you ever find your literary and diplomatic roles to, to clash or you know, whether they actually help each other along. 
No, they help each other. And that's something that I um, said to the president at the beginning. I, I told him that my work is the work of a writer and that it will always be my priority, but that I would be very happy to use this job of a, uh, of a writer to go everywhere and speak not only of books, but of this beautiful and wonderful language that is French. I was, um, when he proposed this to me, uh, I decided to say yes, because I thought that it was interesting for a Moroccan woman, for an African woman to uh, say, yes, I speak French and this is my language. And um, I love this language, it is mine. I'm not just a victim of colonialism and I don't have to justify myself. This is my language as, mu as much as it is the language of uh, Marie who lives in Paris. And uh, for me, it was a statement. And um, I wanted to uh, tell that to all this, this new generation of not only African people, but Francophone people who live in countries where they speak French, but not only French, they speak Arabic, they speak Wolof, they speak Creole, they speak uh, uh, German, a lot of languages. And that's something that is beautiful and really exciting with the Francophone world. It's that it's a multilingual world, uh, French, is always um, rubbing shoulder with other languages and be influenced also by other languages. And that's the kind of métissage that I love and that I think we should defend. I hate the idea of promoting a language uh, by making a war against another language. For instance, I, I completely disapprove people who say, ah, no, no, there is the invasion of English. I said that there are no invasion of English because a language is not an invader. A language is never an enemy. And I love to speak English and I think that everyone should speak English. But my fight is to say that the more language you speak, the more human you are. If you speak two languages, you are two people. You speak three languages, you are three people. And maybe, and I'm quite sure that in a world where people would speak more languages and be able to love together and to seduce one another and uh, to do a lot of things with languages, probably it would be a world with less um, aggressivity and less violence because the moment when you take and you make this effort of learning the language of one another, you also understand that this culture is interesting, is complex, and you have more respect to this language through the language that you are learning. So yeah, for me, it's a very important fight, this fight for multilingualism. I couldn't agree more. Um, I personally think that um, language uh, learning in schools in the UK, it, where I grew up, by the way, though I'm half French, is uh, in an absolutely terrible state. Um, I remember when I was 19, uh, interrailing around Europe and realizing for the first time that it was not the norm to speak only one language. I would be in hostels with, you know, um, a Dutch guy who spoke six languages and a Spanish girl <laughs> who spoke eight. And, you know, it was, it was a, a real wake up call. Um, uh, we have one more question in the, uh, the Q and A, which I'll, I'll move to now. Um, and then, we may have time for another one if somebody pops one in, but we are, we are obviously moving to the later stages of our event now. Um, Karen asks, you speak with great affection about Morocco. Can you see yourself returning there to live? Yes, I can see myself uh, dying there, <laughs> living there, I don't know. Um, you know, it's like uh, when, when you're very much in love, your first love, for instance, you have this first love and then you, uh, you live and um, you get married with someone else and you think of this first love and you're like, oh my God. But I'm pretty sure that if you go back with this first love, it's going to be awful and you're going to be so disappointed that to say, oh my God, I should have left him just as the fantasy of my first love. So the thing is that, uh, I'm worried and I'm afraid that if I go there, um, it's not going to be as beautiful and as easy as I would like it to be. Because this is a place where um, I have also bad souvenirs. This is a, a very, you know, you, there, there is a lot of inequalities. The, 
the the pressure of religion is very important too and i've been living in europe for 20 more than 20 years now i'm not used anymore to have anyone judging me about drinking or smoking in the street or not being religious so i think it would be very difficult for me to readapt to to this so yeah of course i uh, i love my country and i love the people who who live there and i have a lot of friends there but now i'm a woman of 40 years old and i've changed so much so i'm not sure that this uh, that i can go back so that's why you say it might be a place to die rather than live i love the exactly. <laughs> i love the analogy with the first love you know you could run into their arms and, and 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 expire from happiness but i'm not sure you'd want to kind of exactly. get, get up next to them in, in the morning and learn all their terrible habits um thank you well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um we are coming towards the end of the event uh mindful of Layla's time and of everybody who's come out this evening um a, a beautiful summer's evening in the uk a rare beast um and so i think we'll we'll probably draw to a close i want to make sure that we are able to thank our speaker properly and add a few announcements um Layla, this you know, virtual forums are uh, a blessing in many ways. Uh, we're able to do so many more events and make them so much more accessible, um, but they are not the greatest for conveying a, a crashing round of applause, um, which I'm sure we would do if this was a personal event. Um, so please just let me thank you very, very warmly thank on you. behalf of everybody who's, um, who's come to, to hear our conversation tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. To our audience, um, if you would like to purchase a copy of Leila Slimani's most recent novel, The Country of Others, um, it is available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. For more information on book sales, um, please see the festival website or head direct to foxlanebooks.co.uk slash festival hyphen of hyphen ideas. We hope very much that you will continue to be engaged with the York Festival of Ideas. Uh, check out the website, yorkfestivalofideas.com for full details of all events in the programme. We would love to hear your thoughts and to continue conversations about this event and others using the hashtag York Ideas. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>